I'm doing another one of these uh, presentations that I call Digging Deep. Uh, last year, I did one on digging deep into um, the Diederik Cuckoo. And uh, now I'm doing one on digging deep into, into Euplectes, uh, bishops and widow birds. And the reason for doing this is I have a passion for birding, but I also have a passion for biology. And I'm, I think that if we bring uh, uh, a bit more biology, a bit more understanding of sort of fa fairly basic principles of biology into birding, it can help improve and uh, uh, the, the quality of the birding experience and the enjoyment of birding. So, so that's why I'm doing this um, Digging Deep uh, series, if you want to call it a series. Um, I have another one in preparation and I'll tell you, I won't tell you what, the, what it is, but it's going to be another Digging Deep one. So um, who am I? Uh, Lynette said I'm a re retired professor. Well, I, I suppose I am. Um, I'm old enough to be retired, but I'm still working. <laughs> um, but I was a professor of biology for, for 20 years. And um, I then got involved in university management and then uh, uh, for many years had technology as a hobby, and biology as a profession. Then I switched to technology as a profession and now I'm doing biology as a hobby. And looking back at what I did when I was a biology, I did systematics, uh, phylogeny and ecology. So basically evolution, um, e evolutionary and eco ecological biology, that's, that's basically what I did. And after I um, stopped doing biology as a profession, I kind of got into birds and, uh, and birding. Initially, not very seriously, but lately uh, quite seriously and um, as you probably know, I'm one of the co-founders of, of Learn the Birds. Um, and uh, so I'm trying to bring some biology into my birding. And so we're going to go on a little journey tonight. And these are the places we're going to stop. Um, we're not going to spend an equal time at each of these stops, but we will spend a little bit of time at each of them. So we'll start with an overview of the, of the genus Euplectes. What on earth am I talking about anyway? What is Euplectes? Um, we'll look at it through the lens of evolutionary biology. So I'll have a few words to say about evolutionary biology, but I'll keep it nice and simple and, uh, and uh, hopefully easy to understand. And then we'll use that lens to look at a few things. Uh, the evolution and, and phylogeny of Euplectes, that's you know when did they evolve and, and, and uh, diversify. Um, we'll look at mating systems. Um, so we'll stop very briefly on, on, on mating systems and then move on to sexual selection and the evolution of male beauty in birds, which is a really interesting topic. Um, we'll look at animal signals because to understand the evolution of uh, things like uh, color and pattern, uh, we need to understand what, what uh, signals uh, do in animals. And then we'll, we'll come back to uh, the evolution of uh, male beauty and look at uh, female choice in, in Euplectes. And then we'll look at some of the other things that are characteristic of this group and, and the role that they play in the biology, ecology and behavior of these, these birds. So that's, those are the stops that we'll make along the way. So for, for those of you who live in this part of the world, you probably know the genus Euplectes very well. But since we've, we've got um, people from uh, all around the world, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time just going through a little bit about the genus. Um, so um, Euplectes belongs to the, to the uh, weaver family, the Plosidae, um, which contains uh, 15 genera and 118 species. Um, and um, these, these uh, genera include uh, Plosius, the, 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 the sort of typical weavers, um, um, it's a very large genus and it's probably polyphyletic. That means it's not a uniform group. Uh, the, 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 the birds that are placed into this group don't necessarily share a common ancestor, um, a, a common recent ancestor. And, and then there's Anaplectes, the red-headed weaver, which is a very interesting bird all to itself. Uh, birds like the scaly feathered uh, weaver used to be called the scaly-headed finch now. Um, and 
the genus Euplectes. I'm not going to go through all 15 genera, but dot, 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 uh, Euplectes, the bishop birds and the widow birds. So what does Euplectes mean? Um, you is an ancient Greek word for fine or good, um, but this is what the, what the books say. Uh, as a biologist, we always interpret the, the word you as meaning true. So you something is the true, whatever it is. And so you pick these, uh, which means weaver is the true weaver. Uh, so the bishops and the widow birds are the true weavers, according to the, 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 the name of the genus. Um, you pick these um, species are typically strongly patterned, often colorful. Um, for the breeding males um, when they're in their uh, nuptial uh, plumage. But the females and the non-breeding uh, males will typically be more brown, more camouflaged, and look uh, like the, the bird in, in this picture here. And males take on their breeding plumage during uh, spring or early summer when, when they molt. Uh, to gain this uh, this more colorful uh, plumage. Um, there are 17 sp uh, species recognized in the genus Euplectes, so it's 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 not a, a huge genus, but it's a it's a significant one. 17 species is fairly respectable, and they're all native to sub-Saharan Africa, which is is quite interesting. Um, and they comprise the bishops, which typically have a stocky body with a relatively short tail in relation to the size of the body. And they're usually black and some other orange or yellow or red uh, color. And then the widow birds, um, <clears throat> in which the breeding males typically develop a, a, a longer tail than their non-breeding selves or, or, or than the females have. Um, this one, of course, the long-tailed widow bird is the most extreme of the lot. Um, some of them don't have necessarily that long uh, tails, but they typically have longer tails than, than what we would call the bishop bird. So why widow bird? Um, uh, this is a question that gets asked, so I'm just throwing it in here. Um, uh, it seems like the name widow bird is a corruption of uh, the name of the city of Wida in uh, Benin. Um, and it's the same word that gives rise to a wida, like the pintail wida. And, uh, uh, but it, oh, that's interesting. Oh, what? Okay. <laughs> um, so the, it's often thought that, uh, that this is due to the black color and the mourning colors of, uh, that, that uh, black typically represents. And uh, I like to think that too. So I'm going to not uh, change that. But apparently the word originated from the, the city in Benin. Um, so it's well represented in South Africa. We have seven species, and um, oh man, this is this is terrible. Hopefully that doesn't do that. Yes. So yeah, that that was the uh, the widow bird in its morning colors. So as as I said, it's well represented in South Africa. Um, there are seven species, the Southern Red Bishop, which is one of my favorite birds. I could spend hours and hours and hours just watching them. They're so fascinating. Um, the Yellow Crown Bishop, probably even more fascinating. Um, uh, the Yellow Bishop, um, the White Winged Widow Bird, um, which I think is, is, this is one of the prettiest of the widow birds, I think. The Red Colored Widow Bird. Uh, we have a lot of those around here on the on the slopes of the mountain. And it's very very nice to go watch them in summertime. Um, and uh, the fantail widow bird, another one that's quite interesting. It's very similar in shape and form to the white winged widow bird, and uh, and then the long tailed widow bird, which is uh, the one with the most extreme tail. So so that's the group. That's the gen genus Euplectes. So now we're going to just stop at the uh, at the next uh, uh, station, which is looking at things through the lens of evolutionary biology. 
So evolutionary biology is basically the area of biology that uh, studies evolutionary processes like natural selection, sexual selection, common descent, speciation, all of that stuff. Um, the things that produce the diversity of life that we have on Earth today. And evolution is just change over time. So you don't have to remember very much to understand what evolution is. Something changes over time. That's evolution. And evolutionary biology, biology is the study of how those changes happen over time. And so that's the lens that we're going to look at uh, euplectes through today, um, the lens of evolutionary biology. So let's look at what's natural selection. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, it's basically just the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to, uh, to differences in the phenotype, the phenotype being how it looks, what feathers it has and what color it is and how big its body is and shape and all of those things, what it looks like, how its characters are expressed, include its physiology and all of those things. And that phenotype results from an underlying genetic, those uh, different phenotypes result from an underlying genetic difference. And so the difference, differential survival of those phenotypes lead to the differential survival of those genotypes. So natural selection means, says uh, genetic variation exists in all populations. Um, I might have a longer nose than uh, another person. And if there was a circumstance where a longer nose is uh, selected, uh, that might um, uh, increase in frequency in the population. So if you look at this little population of red dots here, you can see that there is uh, some genetic variation here. There's one green one. And if you can imagine um, that this variation is a, is a result of haphazard mu mutations, and some of those haphazard mutations produce phenotypic variation, that is obvious differences. You can see here's another one here that has come about, which is the blue one. And you can see that the blue and the red ones are easily seen. So anything that eats those red dots, uh, probably going to eat the red ones first. And that would lead to some dif differential uh, survival of the um, greener phenotype. And that would lead to differential survival of the underlying genotype. And so the frequency of the genotype and the phenotype changes in the population over time. And um, as a result of this differential survival, you end up with a, um, you know, those, those, th that particular feature increasing within the population. And if you look over here, you'll see that there's a, another mutation here that's made one even, e even more difficult to see. And, and that's basically how natural selection works. It's just the, the differential survival over time. Yeah, that's, um, so now the other concept that I want to introduce is fitness. And when we think of fitness, uh, we, we tend to think of this, but, um, and when people think of survival of the fittest, they often think of it being a, a physical struggle as opposed to a struggle with the environment. Um, and in fact, that's not what, um, what fitness is. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with being better suited for a particular environment. So if, if um, and this was introduced by, uh, by Herbert Spencer in his Principles of Biology in 1864, and, and Darwin liked it as a, as a metaphor for, for, uh, for natural selection. So it, it kind of got into, into common usage and often got into common usage incorrectly. Um, and basically it's the survival of the phenotype that will lead to the most copies of itself in successive generations. So in, in the example of the red dots or the dots, um, the green dots survived more and there were more copies of, of the genotype for those green dots in the next generation. So that's natural selection and fitness because these are key concepts in biology, if you want to understand birds and you want to understand what drives their behavior, what, what has driven their evolution, why the bills are the shape that they are, why the, the males are one color and the females another color, all of that is only understandable if you understand these two basic concepts together. Um, so that's why I bring this in. Um, so, so fitness, if you think about it from, from what we've just described, Fitness is really just a measure of reproductive success. Because 
you don't leave copies of yourself in the, in the next gen of your genes in the next generation if you don't reproduce. Simple. So you've got to survive. You've got to find n number of mates where n is uh, more than zero, and you've got to find you've got to have a successful copulation event, and you've got to produce offspring. And all of those things must happen in order for an organism to be um, to have a fitness of more than zero. If it doesn't um, reproduce, it doesn't have fitness. Okay, it may have uh, some, the genes that it carries may have some fitness because of its relatives having the same genes, but also having other genes that make them more fit. But in general, we can, we can say fitness is basically a measure of, uh, of reproductive success. So survive, find a mate, successfully copulate, produce offspring. Those are the those are the, the key elements of fitness. And then um, another uh, concept that I want to introduce uh, before we move off from this uh, station is phylogeny. And um, probably many of you already know what phylogeny is, but it's worth uh, bringing it up anyway. Um, phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species or a group. Um, especially concerning the lines of descent and the relationships among broad groups of organisms. So we're, um, our relatives are chimpanzees and, and gorillas and more distant from us are the old world monkeys and more distant from us are the new world monkeys and et, et cetera, et cetera. That lineage, that, uh, that evolutionary history is, is, is a phylogeny. And phylogenetics, the study of phylogeny and a phylogenetic tree is basically just a branching diagram that re represents this evolutionary history um, or, or represent not necessarily the evolutionary history, but the evolutionary relationships. History is slightly different from that. Um, and, and, the, and then uh, for the study of phylogenetics, we typically use a, a, a diagram that looks like this, a cladogram. Um, it's a diagram that, that shows relationships among organisms um, it's similar to, but not the same as a phylogenetic tree because the actual ancestor is not in the tree. Um, so these are relationships and the, the distance of relationships of the endpoints. So this is actually a hypothetical uh, a common ancestor here, but it's not a real common ancestor. So it's actually just a measure of the relationships of all of these things that are at the end of the of, of these uh, fork tines. Um, and um, a clade is a group of organisms uh, with a last common ancestor. Now you can see that there's a lot of last common ancestors. So this group here is a clade. This group here is a clade. This group here is a clade. And this group here is a clade. So it's not, um, 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 you know, you, you, you use the term just to uh, discuss a group of organisms with a, with a last common ancestor, but we tend to talk about them in sort of fairly obvious organized groups rather than, uh, um, uh, you know, like the last two. So you can see there's a group, um, they have a last hypothetical common ancestor, um, but there's another clade uh, with the last hypothetical common ancestor, there's another clade over here. So having said all of that, I want to now make use of these concepts to just delve into, um, into Euplectes. And once you've seen how this works with, with this uh, genus, you can pretty much apply it to any group of birds. Um, it's just a, a Euplectes is really interesting because it makes some of these concepts obvious. If I tried to do this with pipits, for example, the same principles apply, but it's much more difficult to illustrate them because they don't have these obvious differences between males and females and long tails and short tails and all of those things. So this is a nice group to use to illustrate these, these concepts. And by the way, if you, if you live on the high felt um, and you want a place to go and just get immersed in, in Euplectes, um, Reed Clay Nature Reserve near Pretoria is absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, you, you, 
I've got pictures and I, not as uh, in focus as this one where four or five species of Euplectes are in the same picture at the same time. They just are so abundant there and, and their behavior is, uh, is really fascinating to watch, especially in the months of December, January up to February or even late November, mid to late November into, into January. They, you could spend um, days and days and days just sitting at replay watching this, uh, this group of birds. Right. So now that we've looked at the lens of evolutionary biology, we're going to apply it to the phylogeny, first of all, the evolution of phyl phylogeny of uh, Euplectes. There was a really interesting paper uh, published in Molecular uh, Phylogenetics and Evolution um, in 2017. Um, and um, so basically, the phylogeny is the evolutionary ancestry of this group. Uh, typically computed. You can use morphological characters. Before we had easy access to DNA, we used morphological characters. Um, I've done uh, pre-DNA uh, cladograms as well and phylogenies, uh, but the DNA makes it obviously much, uh, much uh, uh, easier to, to do this kind of work. So they looked at, um, at the phylogenetic relationships of weaver birds, and um, I extracted just the, just the uh, Euplectes bit of it. And so what they've shown is that weaver birds originated in the mid Miocene. So we're roughly uh, well, 15 plus uh, million years ago, um, associated with the shift in the predominant ecosystems from forest to grasslands, and especially the origin of, of uh, the C4 grasses in the tropics. And of course, us in Africa, that, uh, that, that was a major, major event. It also led to the evolution of pipits and, um, and various other grassland birds like um, um, uh, larks and, and some of the um, uh, cesticulas and, and so on. All are associated with the, with the uh, shift uh, from, from forest ecosystems to grasslands and the evolution of uh, the C4 grasses. And then the, the genus Euplectes came along much later, obviously, um, probably originated in the late Miocene or early Pliocene. So it's not, not that long ago, We're back when, when we had a common ancestor with gorillas that still lived. Um, and, um, and then much of its uh, speciation, much of the speciation of this genus happened during the Pliocene into the Pleistocene. So that's, that's relatively recent in, in the history of birds, given that most birds, um, most, most major bird groups uh, evolved within the, within the first sort of 15 to 20 million years of the, uh, the Chicxulub asteroid um, that led to the uh, uh, extension of the um, larger non-feathered dinosaurs leaving the feathered dinosaurs that we call birds. Right, so here's, uh, here's some of their work and you can see this is a very uh, um, straightforward cladogram here and you can already see clades, can't you? Um, since I, I mentioned them, there's already some clades here. Um, you know, there's one down here. And so you can see that there's two major clades here, um, one that I've colored orange and one that I've colored blue. Um, and if you look at the uh, species that make up those clades, what you can see is um, that there's widow birds in both of them. Well, the red colored widow bird is, is, is sitting among the orange ones. And then there's the uh, yellow bishop that's uh, sitting among the rest of the widow birds. So it seems likely, and, th and, and by the way, this pattern occurs when different, gene, uh, uh, when different um, genetic methods are used as well. So it seems likely that this uh, uh, widow bird versus bishop form has evolved a, a couple of times in, in the group. It's not, uh, uh, they're not, it's not that there's a single common ancestor to all the widow birds and a single common ancestor to all of the bishops. Of course there is if you go far enough back, but um, yeah. So, now you can use the, um, the substitution rates of the, of the genetic uh, uh, material to 
to calculate a molecular clock, and that's how this this uh, evolutionary time frame is calculated uh, to be, you know, to have started in the in the mid Miocene, and and uh, for um, Euplectes to have evolved in the Pliocene and and diversified in into the late Pliocene into the Pleistocene. So that's already, I think, some interesting information. Now, if you think about it. You can go and find this information for almost any group of birds. So if you want to understand how did this group of birds, what, how did they get here? How did they, you know, why are they doing what they do? They're in grasslands. Well, what's the significance of that? Well, the significance of that is, you know, in, in the, in the mid Miocene grasslands became the predominant uh, uh, habitat type and birds changed and occupied that habitat. And so we already know, know some interesting things by looking at this, this group of birds. So now let's uh, stop at another place on our journey. Uh, let's look at mating systems. This is going to be a quick stop, because, uh, but it's necessary because to understand the rest of the places that we're going to go, uh, it helps to understand mating systems. So mating systems basically just um, the, the, the kind of strategies that uh, birds use in order to reproduce. And, you know, their two core strategies are monogamy, the, the, the single mate for life or for at least for a breeding season, or polygamy, more than one mate, um, can be more than one mate, it typically is more than one mate within the same breeding season. Because almost everybody is polygamous on a long enough time scale, including us humans. Um, so one type of uh, polygamy is polygyny, where one male can mate with multiple females during a single breeding season, or polyandry, um, where one female can mate with multiple males during a single breeding season. Um, this is less common than polygyny, um, but uh, some, some um, uh, um, birds like the painted snipe, for example, are, are polyandrous. Um, sh some of the shorebirds uh, are polyandrous. Uh, polygynous uh, birds are much more common, and the genus Euplectes is polygynous. That means that the male can meet mate with more than one female in a breeding season, and what that means is that any genetic thing that he's uh, passing on to the next generation gets amplified, because now instead of passing the genes on to a single female, to a single clutch of eggs, He's passing it on to multiple females to multiple clutches of eggs. So if, if he's got something that really stands out and makes him fit, not fit in the sense of um, uh, you know being able to lift weights, but fit in the sense of he's got something that enables him to find more mates, he's going to pass on those genes more frequently, and that um, those characteristics will will increase in in the population as a result. So. Now let's look at the evolution of male beauty. Um, we, of course, consider uh, the um, you know pretty colors and striking patterns and all of those things beautiful. Um, that, of course, doesn't necessarily mean that they're objectively beautiful to to members of the same species. But let's look at it. Let's try to understand how this male beauty evolves. So, yeah. So you have a, a male that is brightly colored. Uh, strongly patterned, a female that's drab and blends in much better with the environment. So if you think about now uh, fitness and you think about natural selection, um, anything that keeps the animal alive and enables it to get a mate and, and pass on its genes is going to be selected for. And anything that uh, makes it more susceptible to predation, for example, it's going to be selected against. But you would think that the that the red color of the male uh, uh, southern red bishop is going to be causing it to get, um, you know, to become prey more often, and uh, and that may be the case. Um, and but what is the benefit for the male of being colored? And that's where we bring in sexual selection. Now, sexual selection isn't really something it's not really something different from natural selection it's just a form of natural selection where the female behavior acts as the selective force as opposed to some something in the environment um, 
and that's that's really all it is. And this um, concept was introduced by Charles Darwin in the in the Descent of Man in his uh, second book, uh, the Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And it's the selection in relation to sex part that um, um, you know that that we 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 th can think about when we're when we're thinking about sexual selection. Um, now, if you look at uh, sexual selection, basically it's the differential success in reproduction of individuals due to differences in the phenotype, that is how they look or some aspect of their physiology or whatever, that result from some underlying genetic differences that's associated with some aspect of reproduction. So differential success, some aspect of the animal associated with reproduction. That's basically sexual selection. So we look at our at our uh, white-winged widow birds here. Um, two males and a female. Um, we can use that to illustrate this. Um, so there's one form of sele sexual selection, which is mate choice, and typically, in in um, in polygynous species at least, uh, this is going to be female choice, not male choice. Guys, I'm sorry to tell you this, but we don't get a choice. Um, the other form is male contests, where we may, where the, the males may attack one another, or they may engage in ritual combat where they're bouncing up and down, or um, they may have displays of some sort that say, hey, I'm more fit than you. If you don't go away, I'll beat you up, or I'm, you know, it, it, it's difficult to anthropomorphize some of the characteristics that lead to um, um, you know, male behaviors. So sexual selection in a polygynous species is gonna always be, well, let me try this again. Sexual selection by mate choice in polygynous species is all, always going to be by, by female choice. As far as I know, there are no other forms of choice that are known. Um, I could be wrong. Um, I haven't read every book and every paper on the subject, but as far as I know, that's the case. So basically, the male comes along with an investment proposal, you know, sort of like one of these TV shows where you have to uh, get somebody to invest. And the female then takes a look at this investment proposal and gets to make the decision. And that's basically what sexual selection uh, by mate choices. Um, and then you might ask yourself, well, what's the basis for the female making the decisions that she makes and she's making the choice? Um, and, and, and this uh, concept of females making the choice is actually part of a core controversy in evolutionary biology. Um, bit of a storm in a teacup in my opinion but it has been fiercely fought out um and uh, one is uh, is the the, tr the the idea put forward by darwin um that it's purely aesthetic uh, it's got nothing to do with anything other than the female prefers a particular character um we'll come back to why a female might prefer a particular character in a bit um but, uh, you know, the, and, and these characters that the birds evolve are a result of, of, the, uh, of the female aesthetic. So here's a, a female Goldie's bird of paradise. Um, and here's the male. It's got these amazing uh, feather patterns and behaviors and so on. As a result of female choice. But why is the female making that choice? Wallace... Um, Alfred Russell Wallace, who co-discovered uh, um, natural selection with Charles Darwin, um, said, no, the, the characters are a signal of male fitness. The female is not really just being aesthetic. That's crazy. And so the two uh, lines of thought became a major controversy in biology that went on and on and still going on today. Um, I still read papers um, that are published where the ideas of Alfred, Alfred Russell Wallace are assumed as the basis, as the base premise 
for the rest of the work. And it kind of completely undermines the, uh, the actual uh, biology that was carried out. So there's, it's still going on. This is still a, a controversy. Now, if you think back, that this was in Victorian England when, you know, um, it was a very a patriarchal society, uh, despite having a, um, a queen um, running the show. And the idea that uh, evolution could happen because females made a choice was just culturally unacceptable. So this isn't really a biology controversy here. This is, this is uh, Victorian culture imposing itself on, on, uh, on biology. So there's a really good uh, book by, by Richard Prum, Rick Prum from Yale University. I'm, I, I've been talking to him. I'm trying to get him to, to do a webinar on, uh, on, on Learn the Birds. He's, uh, he's just published a book, not just, a couple of years ago. He published a book on the evolution of beauty, how Darwin's forgotten theory of mate choice shapes the animal world and us. And most of his work is on birds. And if you, if you want to understand this stuff uh, better, um, get a hold of this book and read it because it is absolutely fascinating. Anyway, that's, um, that's the, um, that's the uh, uh, idea that uh, um, females select mates either based on the, ma the mate, uh, the potential mate advertising that he's healthy and fit and able to uh, produce young or <clears throat> that she's just, she just happens to like red feathers. And so she selects males with red feathers, or she just happens to like long tail and she selects males with long tails. And that's it. There's no more to it than that. So what are some of the characters, characteristics that feature in uh, sexual selection? There's morphological characters and there's behavioral characters. Um, and morphologically, you can look at body shape. Uh, there's things like feather colors and patterns. Uh, tail length, uh, shape, tail shape and form. Then there's display behaviors, uh, feather movement and presentation. And if you think of some of these weird birds of paradise um, that you get in, in um, parts of Asia um, and, the, and the kinds of strange behaviors that you get there, you, know, you can see that the um, sexual selection can create some really wild stuff. So flight and other movement patterns. Um, song, of course, is another one, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, and, and then the mating behaviors, uh, the, how the male presents himself and how the female makes a choice and makes a decision about which mate to choose. So let's just look, look at a couple of these uh, within this uh, genus Euplectes. So if you look at body shape and you, you ignore the tail, there isn't a huge um, amount of difference in body shape among, among the different uh, um, species. There's not much variation within the genus. There is some variation though um, on a small scale within species. And so that variation within species, of course, is what leads to the, um, the selective opportunities that, that uh, get presented to the female. Then <clears throat> if you look at um, morphological characters, um, there's feather colors and patterns. Now in, in Euplectes, there's basically black, white, yellow or red slash orange feathers that's that's it that's that's the that's the extent of, of the culture so of the uh, color differences so you you know you have white winged widow bird for example that's black white and and yellow um the yellow crowned bishop which is yellow and black and uh, and then you have the southern red bishop which is red sometimes it appears orange and and the long-tailed uh, widow bird which is black white and and red and, and those, are, those are all the colors that you find, but a lot gets done with those colors. As you can see from the, from the differences, they look, those birds look radically different based on just the colors alone. Then if we look at other characters like uh, the tail length, you can see that the uh, Southern Red Bishop has a short tail. The fan tailed with a bird has a, has a, a longer tail and the long tailed weather bird has obviously an absurdly long tail. So, you know, if you look at the, uh, at the, at the ratio there, of body length to tail length, you can see that there's, an, there's a tremendous uh, variation there within the genus. And there is also significant variation in these characters within the species as well. And that creates opportunities for, uh, for selection to happen. 
Then there's behavioral characteristics like the display be behaviors and the feather movement and the presentation of the bird. So here's a Southern red uh, bishop that's just sitting on a branch, along comes a female, and suddenly he blows up like a balloon. Well, he's not blowing up like a balloon, he's just erecting all these, all these feathers. Um, he'll do the same thing if another male gets a little too close to him as well. Um, and then the yellow crowned bishop, which is the master, uh, in my opinion, of, of um, you know, erecting feathers in weird ways and, and, and uh, doing odd things within this group. And so they fluff up their feathers, the feathers on the back, the feathers on the head, the feathers on the chest. And all of these are things that can be the subject of uh, sexual selection. But are they? Then there's the behavioral characters. So, you know, the white-winged widow bird and the fantail widow bird splay out their, their tail. Um, the yellow crowned bishop flies like a bumblebee. I'm sorry for the poor quality of my picture. I must go back and get a better picture this summer. Um, but the yellow crown, crown uh, bishop flies like a bumblebee with these yellow feathers uh, flopping around in the wind and it looks really cool and it, it doesn't fly very fast. It almost sometimes seems to fly backwards. It doesn't, of course, but it flies very slowly with its wings beating really fast and these yellow feathers creating a pattern. And then the long tail with a bird, uh, which does have a, a absurdly long tail, but it also does these tail displays, which are um, quite fascinating to watch. Um, and having spent some time watching them, I have a sense that the tail displays, when it displays the tail like that, it's more for the other males than it is for the females. But this is something which, as far as I know, has never been researched. So it would be quite interesting. So now, as we get closer to the end of the journey, I want to look at animal signals. And what does this have to tell us about what's going on with these birds? So animal signals, <clears throat> you can think of um, signals as being structural or behavioral characters that can be used by one animal, the sender, to influence the behavior of another, the receiver or the recipient. So an obvious signal would be a bird calling. It's calling. Is it calling to attract a mate? A mate? So it wants to influence the behavior of a female. Is it calling to... Um, a market's territory, or uh, in which case it wants to influence the behavior of another male. Um, so these are signals uh, that that are there to create influence. So we have a signal, and we have a receiver, or a signaler and a receiver. Um, a signal, sorry, a sender and a recipient. So we have the sender that creates the signal to influence some aspect of the reci recipient's behavior leading to a response, which is typically a behavioral response that has consequence, and that consequence has an impact on the fitness of the animal that's being influenced, as well as the animal that's sending the signal. So think about that. The animal that's sending the signal is also in, uh, has a consequence of having sent the signal, otherwise it wouldn't be sending the signal, because the signal wouldn't be selected for and it would eventually die out of the population. So, um, you know, it, this is not real. <laughs> you know, the, they're not getting up there and saying, okay, I'm going to send a signal. But the consequence of it from a metaphorical perspective is exactly the same as if you sent a signal to a recipient to influence that recipient's behavior to have a consequence on your fitness and the fitness of uh, the recipient. So it's almost like the signal is actually gene to gene. It's like a gene to gene message because it's the gene, it's the genetics that cause the animal to have the character that makes it send the signal. It's also the genetics that have, that, that hold the, uh, the characters that cause the, the receiver to respond to the signal. So it's almost like a gene was sending a signal to, a gene, to another gene through the medium of the phenotype. So that's, that's kind of what uh, signaling is. It, uh, we, you know, we just mustn't think of it as, um, you know, if I got out and started sh flying a flag and sending a signal, that's a conscious thing. This is not a conscious thing. This is genes acting on genes. Yeah. Okay, so here's, um, 
he's a long-tailed widow bird and a female. Um, he's sending us, he wants, he's going to send a signal. Um, what signal is he sending? He's sending the signal, I've got a long tail. Um, and according to Darwin's aesthetic view, uh, the longer tail is telling the female that I'll give you sexy sons because sexy sons are sons that have long tails. Not sexy sons are sons that will have short tails. So if the female wants her genes to be once in quotation marks, I have to be careful about this anthropomorphizing because it's a, it can kill the story. Um, uh, but the female is genetically predisposed to want her genes to be um, passed on to more offspring that will lead to more offspring in, in future generations because this, those genes led to there being more copies of those same genes in the current generation. So it's basically the genes are acting, not the, not the individual. Um, so the signal says, I'll give you sexy sons. She then says, longer tails please me. She doesn't know why longer tails please her. It's just the genetic thing. It's a, you know, a, you know why, why do you have, um, you know, the bump on the end of your nose or your ear have a lobe or all of those things. We don't think about it. It's not, it's not a conscious thing. It's just something that genetically occurs. So what does she do? She says, okay, you've got a longer tail. I know you're going to give me sexy sons. I'll grant you access to mating. So now the genes that cause, this, uh, cause the longer tail have caused the female through this uh, signaling to behave in such a way that the genes are propagated. And that's how this whole cycle of female choice and male um, uh, characteristics or male beauty um, um, happens. So the consequence is an increase in the frequency of genes that produce the signal, the longer tail, and, and so uh, fitness. The fitness of the female and the fitness of the male are both influenced um, through this, through the signaling uh, that happens. Now there's, you know, the, the other alternative, the, sorry, I didn't mean to move ahead there. The other alternative, the, the, the honest signaling view that uh, Alfred Russell Wallace was a proponent of, and this view is not mutually exclusive. So the male could also be more healthy, more whatever, um, you know, and could also be, there could also be a component of honest signaling in this, in this messaging as well. Um, the result, the end result would be the same, which is why it's so difficult to separate them and why people still argue about it because it's, it's just so difficult to, um, to separate them unless you have really good models. And that's where uh, Rick, Rick Prom's book comes in because he's, he's, him and his students have got some really good models that they've, that they've run to test these hypotheses. Right, but that's got nothing to do with Euplex. Well, it's got, it's, it, they didn't do that work on Euplexes. So um, now female choice. So the long, uh, I mean, sorry, um, the long-tailed uh, widow bird, um, the male, as, as we've said already, as this really, really gives you long tail, the female's pretty drab brown. Um, the male comes into his colorful plumage in the spring. Um, during the winter, he pretty much looks the same as the female with a slight little red patch on the shoulder that you can sometimes still see in the winter. So <clears throat> there, there was a, 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 a classic paper uh, that was published by Malta Anderson uh, back in 1982. It's, it's quite a long time ago now, but it's a, it's it's still one of the best pieces of work on this uh, on this group. We know that males are polygynous, right? We know that um, that the species has the most extreme ornamentation ornamentation of the tail within the genus Euplectes. And what they did was they they um, shortened the tail artificially, and then they lengthened the tail artificially, and then they looked at the number of nests or the number of mates. Uh, but the number of nests that signify the number of mates that the male um, was able to, um, to mate with in, in this particular breeding season. So the males with the, with the shortened tail um, didn't always manage to mate. Uh, so they ended up with a mean of less than one uh, nest uh, per male. So the average um, males with average uh, tail length 
managed to get one nest per male in the breeding season. But the ones with the longer tails are artificially longer tailed, managed to get all the way up to twice the number of nests as the males with, um, with a normal tail length. And this was true even if the male had such a long tail that it couldn't fly. So, which leads me to believe that that, that splaying of the tail that uh, create that beautiful pattern is not to do with, um, with the female choice, but to do more with the um, with signaling to other males. So, so this was a really interesting piece of work. And um, they also were able to show that the male defense of its territory wasn't affected by tail length. What they didn't have much to say was about, you know, the behavior of the males and, and the way in which the males arranged their tails in, in their displays. But, you know, this clearly supports Darwin's view of sexual selection by mate choice, um, by female choice. Right? But, like I said, you know, there's more to a tail than just the length. Um, there's also how the tail gets displayed and all of those things. And, you know, there's an, another master's or PhD thesis in this, uh, in this bird yet, I'm pretty sure, at least one. Okay, so now I'm going to just do one or two quick things. Uh, well, not, not quick, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll finish up in about 10 minutes. Um, let's talk about legs. So there's another behavioral pattern um, that happens in birds and, and other animals. And it just happens to happen in Euplectes as well, and that's lecking. So a lek is an aggregation of male animals that gather together to, to engage in some kind of um, competitive displays and courtship rituals. And they, as, as they're doing this, they're attempting to entice, entice females to come to the area where they are and to choose them as mates. And um, the male territories in a lek are typically close to other males. Uh, within visual uh, and, and auditory range. Uh, so they can hear each other and they can see each other. And in the little video that I'm going to show you now, you will see that very, very clearly. Um, now, um, for this, we have to go to Kenya. And I don't have any pictures of this bird or any videos of this bird, um, but it's such a fascinating thing that I reached out to a few people and got them to lend me some of their, their pictures and videos. So we're going to Kenya um, and we're going to look at the Jackson's widow bird, which is found in Kenya and Tanzania. It's a lecking widow bird species. Um, and it has this peculiar behavior that it's, it's down in the grass. You don't see them. And then suddenly it pops up and then it goes back down in the grass again. It pops up, turn, goes back down in the grass. It might run along the ground and then turn and then pop up and go back down again. And that's its display. That's the equivalent of that bird, um, what the uh, long-tailed widow bird does when it has its uh, tail in that nice curved shape. So, so watch this bird here, how it gets interested. And watch this one here, the jump. So these are the, these are the weird jumping widow birds. Jackson's widow bird found in Kenya and Tanzania. And this is a lek. And you can hear them calling and you can see them jumping, jumping up and down. There is a female down there somewhere, at least one. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing that. Keep an eye on this one. Let's see, now it's starting to get interested. Now it's going to start. It's just pop, 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 pop. Jump a little bit, jump a little bit, then boom, it starts to go. Now they're both going. And you can have five or six of these, seven or eight of them, all in view at the same time, all jumping up and down. It's just the weirdest thing. If you're used to our widow birds in Southern Africa, these guys are freaky. That one just went off over here somewhere, but he's still jumping. And 
well, you can see it. It's, it's, it's just it's, it, that's it. That is a bird, a widow bird on a lake displaying, trying to attract females to come to this area. And both of them, because both of them are jumping, they're going to attract more females than if it was just one jump. So, so the lick is to get the females to come to the area. I mean, the display is to get the females to come to the area. So I'm going to just move on past this now. So uh, what's going on here? Um, so the females come to the lake just uh, for mating, and um, and they nest on their own away from the uh, from the lecking area. So they come, mate, and go away. Um, and um, what the what uh, what this uh, uh, Stefan Anderson? Sorry, I, I forgot to mention the Stefan Anderson paper. Um, published in the Behavioral Ecology and Social Biology um, did was to look at the factors that uh, look at the, uh, the, the reproductive fitness in relation to some of these behaviors. So the females visit the lake solely for mating and then they go and nest further away from the lake. The males play no role whatsoever in any of that other than just mating the female. So he has roughly 10 or 15 seconds work to do. Um, Male-male competition didn't affect uh, female choice within the legs. And there was a number of things that had strong correlation with the success in mating. Uh, one of those was the, the, the rate of the, of the jump display. So if you, if you look at those uh, birds that we just saw, you see they started off, they were jumping, they were jumping. And then after a while, they were like, like jack in the box. You know? um, so the rate of the jump display and the presence of the male in the in the lake. Those were two things that did get correlated with uh, mating success. But the big thing was the length of the tail. So um, the jumping got the females to come in. But the length of the tail was the thing that influenced their their ultimate fitness because it determined their their chance of copulating with a visiting female. The females always pick the males with the longest tail. So they'll come in because you're jumping, but their choice is dependent on the on the length of the tail, and that obviously suggests sexual selection in these traits. Uh, the jump display, um, because it gets the females to come in, that's the first step that has to happen before there's any mating, and then the length of the tail is the thing that leads to the selection. So. And then they found that tail length was also po positively related to body condition, which kind of um, supports the honest signaling. Uh, but of course, this, as I said before, you know, the aesthetic versus the adaptive uh, um, model is not mutually, they're not mutually exclusive. So there's no reason why they can't both work together. Okay, so the last uh, place we're stopping is with um, the Southern um, Fed Bishop. And um, this is a, a study by the, the same Stefan Anderson that we, we just looked at his work uh, and Sarah Pryke used to be, I think, at the University of KZN. Um, so it, it's been observed that some female preference for longer tails is shown in some widow birds. They, they seem to like birds, uh, males with longer tails. But then why don't they just undergo strong selection and, and end up with longer and longer tails. So they did some really interesting work, which I'm trying to summarize in my little diagram here. So bird with a normal sort of ordinary bishop tail, female comes along and says, you know, I like you, gives him one like. Uh, a little bit of extra tail feathers are glued on and the female says, I really like your sexy tail and gives him two likes. And he's got a nice long tail, but he still obviously looks like a bishop bird. She says, I really love your sexy tail and mates with him. If he gets a longer tail by having more tail feathers glued on, she says, who are you? I don't recognize you. So that's, the, that's kind of the interesting thing that's going on in the widow birds is that there is an optimum length of tail that the females will choose a male with a longer tail. But once it gets longer than that, she doesn't recognize the male as her own species anymore. And that kind of holds back the bishop birds 
from undergoing this um, uh, runaway selection for a longer tail. So that's a, another interesting thing that we can learn from, from Reflectis. And you know, these, these kinds of things go on in other birds as well, but they're a lot, hard, a lot harder to see. The last thing, uh, carotenoid pigments. Um, uh, carotenoid pigments um, are found in all of the uh, members of the genus Reflectis. They cause the yellow and, and orange color. Um, and what we know from carotenoid pigments is that the, uh, they are produced by plants, uh, terrestrial plants and green al and, and, and algae, as well as some bacteria and some fungi. But most of the, of the uh, ones that uh, the, the carotenoids that birds um, have come from plant material. So notice that there's no, no birds listed. Uh, the colors are obtained from foods, but the birds have the capability to change, uh, to make small chemical changes that can influence the color of the carotenoid compounds. And many birds can thus chemically modify the, um, uh, and selectively deposit these pigments that they ultimately get the precursors of uh, from their food. So somebody, um, I, I think I've got it written down somewhere on this slide, if not this slide, the next one, um, did some, some studies of the red colored widow bird to look at what, is the, what, what does this red pigment actually do in their, in their ecology and behavior. So males establish territories and, and defend them against intruders. This is, if you, if you go, you know, if I go in the summer up onto the slopes of uh, Maripskop, uh, these many, 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 many of these uh, red collar widow birds, and you can watch them for hours, just looking at, the, uh, at, at how they behave. Um, they establish territories and they defend them against intruders. Um, the females uh, position themselves and build nests, uh, usually lined with grass. The males don't provide any parental care whatsoever. Um, and they have this carotenoid pigment that's uh, deposited in this red patch that gives them their, their name, the red colored widow bird. Sarah Pryke, yes, it was Sarah Pryke again. Um, and um, so they looked at the uh, length of the tail and the carotenoid pigment and, and had a look at how that influences um, the outcome of interactions. So the tail length determines mating success through female choice, just like in the other widow birds, um, including the, the, the jumping Jackson's widow bird. And uh, tail length had no effect in in male-male competition, just like with the long-tailed widow bird. The longer the tail, shorter the tail doesn't matter in terms of male-male competition. It's only the, the females choosing the longer tails that gives them the advantage. Um, but the red color seems to function in male-male agonistic interaction. So an agonistic interaction is basically any social behavior related to conflict, um, including fighting, threatening, displaying, retreating, doing things to placate the, the, the enemy and doing conciliation things. So all of these would be agonistic behaviors. And so what they found is that males with a red color dominated males with an orange color. And, and they found some birds that had brown and blue colors and the orange colors and the red colors dominated the, uh, the brown and the blue colors. So that, that, that is interesting. So the, the, uh, the carotenoid pigments seem to be more about male-male interactions than they are about female choice. They don't really, the females don't really care about the, the red color. You know, they're interested only in the long tail, that's it. Um, they interpreted the data as honest signaling. I, I find it very difficult and unconvincing. Um, not to say that you could rule out honest signaling, but you couldn't rule it in either. Um, this is a very difficult, uh, very challenging uh, thing to figure out, whether it's honest signaling versus um, the female aesthetic. And it can be both. And it could be one first, and then later on just becomes the aesthetic, because that's how the genes work got nothing to do with actual signaling. It's the impact of the signaling characteristic on the genes. So that's the journey that we've been on. I hope it's been interesting and useful. Um, you know, we've looked at the genus, we looked at evolutionary biology, we looked at the phylogeny and origin of uh, Euplectes, we looked at mating systems, we looked at sexual selection, we looked at the role of signaling in sexual selection and female choice, and then we looked at 
carotenoid pigments and whether or not they have anything to do with sexual selection. Whether, they, whether or not they have anything to do with sexual selection by female choice versus male-male interactions. And that's it. So thank you very much for, for taking the time and uh, staying here. Um, and hopefully there will be some questions. I believe Lynette uh, and um, I'm handing back to you, sorry. Um, very interesting talk. Um, 